Greetings by fellow free mother of thinkers. This is L3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Beehive State of Utah. And today's date, Monday, August 18th, 2015. Yeah, it's been a while since I did my uh, last podcast, but um, I am doing well. Just been busy the past few days. For the week at the most, so uh, apologize for the inconvenience, but thanks for your patience. Yeah, I'm be t- doing some a few topics, and I'll get my back of the swing of things, but that's okay. So, um, first thing I'm gonna be talking about came from the Tenth Amendment Center, and this one's entitled "Tactics for Taking Down the Police State." This is done by John Whitehead, and as it reads here. The people have the power. All we have to do is awaken that power in the people. The people are unaware. They're not educated to realize that they have power. The system is so geared that everyone believes the government will fix everything. We are the government, by John Lennon. That's a quote. Shadow with the corporate media that marches in lockstep with the government. Elected officials maintain order rather than Matee out justice. Americans often feel they have no voice, no authority, no recourse when it comes to holding government officials accountable and combating rampant corruption and injustice. We're impotent in the face of SWAT teams that breaks down doors and leaves toddlers scared, scarred for life. We're helpless to prevent police shootings that we leave unarmed citizens dead for other reasons that the, than the police officers involved felt threatened. We shrug dismissively over the plight of fellow citizens who have their heads cracked, their bodies broken, and their rights violated for failing to jump to attention when a police officer issues an order. And we fail to care about the thousands of individuals who have been punished with extreme sentences for nonviolent offenses and are forced to spend their lives as a modern-day slave in bondage to private prisons and the profit-driven corporations they serve. Make no no mistake about it. Virtually everything, anything and everything, is a crime nowadays. Feeding the birds, growing vegetables in your front yard, etc. To such an extent that if a prosecutor, police officer, and judge were so inclined, you could be locked up for any inane reason or insane reason. This is tyranny dressed up in the global official garb of the police state. It is self-righteous, heavy-handed arm of the law being used as a decoy to divert your attention to the so-called criminals in your midst. The fishermen threw back small fish into the ocean. The mother who let her child walk to the playground alone. The pastor holding Bible studies in his backyard so you so that you don't focus on the criminal behavior being perpetrated by the government. Bribery, cronyism, electoral fraud, slush funds, graft, pork, theft, and on and on. In the, in the face of such abject injustice, outright corruption, and overtly overt in, in, inequality, it's hard to feel empowered to believe the average citizen can make a difference. It's hard to persuade anyone to stand against tyranny when you all, you, all you can promise them, as a as a reward, is prosecu- persecution, prosecution, and a one way trip to the morgue. And when it comes, when the outcome seems to be foregone conclusion, the government always wins. It can seem pointless, even foolhardy, to dare the, to challenge the system. As such, it's far easier to buy into the political process, even though elections amount to nothing of consequence. There are also who subscribe to the notion that an armed revolution is the only thing that will save America. These armed resistors are making themselves easy targets and will be the first to be taken down by militarized police who are trained to kill and armed to the teeth with every kind of weapon imaginable, from grenade launchers, sniper rifles, to armored vehicles and Black Hawk helicopters. So how do, you, how do you not only push back against police state bureaucracy, corruption, and cruelty, but it's also launch a counter-revolution aimed at reclaiming control over the government using nonviolent means? You can start by changing the rules and engaging in some nonviolent guerrilla tactics. 
employ militant nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience, which Dr. which Martin Luther King Jr. used to great effect through the use of sit-ins, boycotts, and marches. Take part in grassroots activism, which takes a trickle-up approach to governmental reform by implementing change at a local level. In other words, think nationally, but act locally. And then, while you're at it, nullify everything the government does that does that is illegitimate, egregious, and blatantly unconstitutional. Various cities and states have been using this historic doctrine with mixed results on issues as wide-ranging as gun control and health care to claim freedom from federal laws they find onerous or wrong-headed. Where nullification can be particularly powerful, however, it is in the hands of the juror. As law professor Ila Salman explained, jury nullification is the practice by which a jury refuses to convict someone accused of a crime if they believe the law in question is unjust or the punishment is excessive. According to a former federal prosecutor Paul Butler, the doctrine of jury nullification is premised on the idea that ordinary citizens, not government officials, should have the final say as to whether a person should be punished. Imagine that a world where the citizenry, not the government or its corporate controllers, actually call the shots and determine what is just. In a, in a world of rampant overcriminalization, where the average citizen unknowingly breaks three laws a day, jury nullification acts as a check on runaway authoritarian criminalization and in the increasing network of confusing laws that are passed with neither the approval nor oftentimes even the knowledge of the citizenry. Indeed, Butler believes so strongly in the power of nullification to balance the scales between the powers of the prosecutor and the power of the people that he advises. If you are ever on a jury in a marijuana case, I recommend that you vote not guilty. Even if you think the defendant actually smoked pot or sold it to another consenting adult. As a juror, you have this power under the Bill of Rights. You exercise it. If you become part of a proud tradition of American jurors who help make our laws fair. In other words, it's we the people who can and should be determined, determining what laws are just, what activities are criminal, and who can be jailed for what crimes. Not only should punish the fit the crime, but the laws of the land should also reflect the concerns of the citizenry as opposed to the profit-driven priorities of the corporate America. Unfortunately for thousands of Americans who are serving life sentences for nonviolent crimes as a result of harsh mandatory sentencing laws, Passed by tough on crime politicians, the punishment rarely fits the crime. As I point out in my book, Battlefield America, The War of the American People, which every ill inflicted upon us by the American police state, from over criminalization and surveillance of militarized police and private prisons, it's money that drives the police state. And there is a lot of money to be made for criminalizing nonviolent activities and jailing Americans for nonviolent offenses. This is where the power of jury notification is so critical to reject inane laws and extreme sentences and counteract the edicts of a profit driven governmental elite that sees nothing wrong with jailing someone for a lifetime for a relatively insignificant crime. Of course, the power is that don't want the citizenry to know that it has any power at all. They would prefer that we remain clueless about, gov about the government's many illicit activities, ignorant about our constitutional rights, powerless to bring about any real change, indeed so determined that they are to keep us in the dark about the powers vested in we the people. As the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1895 that jurors had no right during jurors to be told about jury nullification. Moreover, anyone daring to educate a jury by, about nullification runs the risk of prosecution. Just recently, for example, 56-year-old Mark Ian Elsley 
and Ian Selly was charged with seven counts of jury tampering for handing out jury notification flyers outside of Denver courtroom. Now, Ian Nass Ian Nass Nasselli is not being accused for advocating or for or against any case in progress, nor is he charged with targeting any particular members of the jury. Nevertheless, Ian Nasselli could be sentenced to one to three years in prison because he dared to educate jurors about an option that had that no judge or prosecutor ever mentions in court. The right to acquit who may be guilty if they also believe that law is unjust. Such intimidation tactics prove less successful when used by Julian Heckling, Heckling who was accused of jury tampering hand, handing out notification pamphlets in Manhattan. A federal district court judge found Heckling not only innocent of the charge of jury tampering, but was also, but was, but went so far as to warn that the law Title 18, Section 1504, raises significant First Amendment concerns. The First Amendment squarely protects speech concerning judicial proceedings and public debate regarding the functioning of the judicial system, so long as the speech should not interfere with the fair and impartial administration of justice. Jury notification has played a significant role in our nation's history. It was championed by early on by John Hancock and John Adams and relied on at various points since then to push back against laws deemed egregious, unjust, or simply out of step with the times. Most recently, jury notification has become a popular tactic to throw up laws that mandate harsh punishments for those convicted of possessing even minimal amounts of marijuana. For instance, in one case I worked on years ago, a jury refused to convict a 54-year-old man who has been charged with possession of marijuana. Prosecutors claim that a SWAT team doing an area-wide land and air sweep has spotted two marijuana plants growing in a hollow of a dead tree of a man's 39-acre property. He had been found not guilty. He would have been sentenced to jail, and his 90-year-old mother, blind, deaf, and dependent on him for care, would have to be institutionalized. In deliberate and closing arguments, the prosecutor warned the jury that disagreements with the laws against pot possession and disapproval of police tactics are not valid reasons to nullify a case. Of course, those are the exact reasons why more Americans should opt for nullification. In an age in which government officials accused of wrongdoing, police officers, elected officials, etc., are treated as General, with general leniency, while the average citizen is prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Jury nullification is a powerful reminder that, as the Constitution tells us, we the people are the government. For too long, we've allowed our so called representatives to call the shots. Now it's time to restore the citizenry to their rightful place in the Republic as the master, m- masters, not the servants. Jury nullification is one way of doing so. The reality we, we, which we must contend that is, ju- that is justice in America is reserved for those who can't afford to buy their way out of jail. For the rest of us who are dependent on the fairness of the system, there exists a multitude of ways in which justice can and does go wrong every day. Police misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, judicial bias, inadequate defense, prosecutors who care about winning the case and seeking justice, judges who care most about what is legal than what is unjust, than what is just, jurors who know nothing of the law and are left deliberate in the dark about life and death decisions, and an overwhelming body of laws, statutes, and ordinances that render the average American a criminal no matter how law-abiding they might think themselves. As I said before, when you go in a courtroom, you're going, to go, you're going up against three adversaries who are more often than not are operating off the same playbook, the police, the prosecutor, and the judge. If, you, if, you're, have, if you're to have any hope of remaining free, and I use that word loosely, the best remains in your fellow citizens. They may not know what the Constitution says, 
Studies have shown Americans to be abysmally ignorant about their rights. They might may not know what the, what the laws are. There are so many on the books that the average American breaks three laws a day without knowing it. And they may not even believe in your innocence, but if you're lucky, they will have a conscience that speaks louder than the logistic tones of the prosecutors and the judges and reminds them that justice and fairness go, go hand in hand. That is ultimately what jury nullification is all about, restoring a sense of fairness to our system of justice is the best protection we the people against the oppression and tyranny of the government and God knows we can use all the protection we can get. Most of all, jury notification is a powerful way to remind the government all the, all those bureaucrats will appoint themselves judge, jury, and jailer overall that we are and have have and do that were the ones who set the rules. If they don't like it, they can get another job. And actually, um, John Whitehead, right? It's John Whitehead. John Whitehead, he did write, he, this original source came from Brotherford.org. And that's his commentary. And I have to agree with Mr. Whitehead completely. And you know, a lot of my listeners had me preach about adrenalification natural born rights, etc. You can make the difference. And I don't give a damn what laws you have in the books. No victim, no crime. And they talk about, yeah, decriminalizing drugs. If someone gives like marijuana or cocaine to a juvenile, that's a whole different ball game. They're talking about consenting adults here. And that's what Mr. Whitehead has addressed in this article. Definitely, my friends, you got a lot of power. If you go on, get jury duty, don't complain about it on Facebook and whine about the system. That's cowardly and unethical. And I may say this to people about that in good faith. Be, get involved if you get jury duty. Don't be afraid of the, these tyrannical vultures who are in the courtroom. You got more power than them. All of them combined. One juror can can hang a jury. One person. No matter what state you're in. That's what natural born rights are. It's guaranteed under the Ninth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Your rights are enumerated within the United States of America. I don't want to hear you complain. I want you to do. Be proactive. Educate. Agitate. Organize. Share this with everyone you know. I do it all the time. I chat with folks out there. If you people know me on Facebook and Twitter, I put this information out, including my my podcast, all out of homage. Don't be afraid of these people. Hate fear control no more. That's how. That's my uh, motto too. I use that in one of my songs. Hopefully, I'm hoping to get that done as soon as possible. This is why you always gotta remain vigilant. Truth, justice, and the goody two shoes way is the road to entrapment. And don't use it out of anger, but love and finesse. That's be strategic, Sun Tzu style. Alright, next one. Heard about this row that happened in um, Broward County. And a friend of mine sent it to me from InfoWars. Dot com, but there was a link for that on the Broward Palm Beach New Times, and it came out Monday. This was written by Jess Watson. It's entitled here, Black Lives Matter Activists Burn Confederate Flag Block Entrance to Rally Picnic. This was done by Jess Swanson. And it said, read here, on, Sat- on Sunday, Demetrius Vaughn walked past Plantation Heritage Park, where almost 200 Confederate flag supporters were meeting at a, for a road rally. The 23-year-old holding, 23-year-old with a holding signs that read "Guy hates flags" and "Cops kill." He was headed to the Black Lives Matter counter protest that was meeting nearby. That's when, that's when Vaughn says he heard a man with a Confederate flag pinned to the back of his truck and shout, "Damn!" 
and Vaughn kept walking. They said they're displaying southern pride, but flag, that flag has, no, has so much blood against my people. Vaughn told New Times after he joined almost 40 activists, it's not right to come out where we say and blatantly show white supremacy that flag and that all the hate in our face. At 12.30 p.m., Vaughn and the group marched to the entrance of Plantation Heritage Park, locking cars and says trucks decked in Confederate flags from embarking from their own on their road rally. Protesters passionately wave signs and chant a megaphone, hey, 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 ho, white supremacy has got to go. They say the Confederate flag supporters look on many dismissively laughing and flipping the bird. This lasts about 10 minutes until activists were met by the plantation police officers who tried to steer them out of the roadway. Within a few minutes, they begrudgingly moved aside and allowed the fleet of Confederate flags supporters to depart, beeping and shouting back in retaliation. Protesters then lit a Confederate flag on fire and threw its burnt remains on the road. It was then repeatedly run over. One protester even wiped the flag on her butt and laid it down to the road. A Confederate flag supporter refused to drive over it, getting out of the truck, picking it up, and kissing it, and kissing it. That Confederate flag is a symbol of bigotry and hate. Cassia, Lyon, tell New Times, we don't want it in our town. After the, to- after the line of Confederate flag supporters made its way through, they continued on street sides until reaching Markham Park, where the pavilion was rented for a picnic. But when demonstrators arrived at Markham, they were again met by many protesters. Met by protesters. This time, protesters had blocked the park, park entrance. The line of traffic piled up a quarter mile down the State Road 84. A Confederate flag backer on a motorcycle grew frustrated and drove through the line of protesters locking arms. One motorcycle snacked around and basically had no qualms plowing through the entire crowd. Kara Reeser tells the New Times, I don't want to get run over. So I stepped slightly to the right. My sign got run over and hit me. It's bent. I haven't moved. I had it. If I hadn't moved, he would have run me down. Activists held up the rally for at least half hour before the police pointed him out to an area from the Confederate flag rally's picnic pavilion. Activists marched ahead, and uh, Confederate blood flag backers followed behind. At the pavilion, caution tape separated protesters from the Confederate flag backers. Both sides yelled. With some of its offensive, one woman told the activists to get a job. There, there was a serious debate about the history and the means of the Confederate flag. Charmaine Lewis, a young woman with the Black Lives Matter movement, spoke openly. There was a lot of arguing, Lewis tells. New Times, we had a conversation about the history of black liberation and history of the Confederacy. By the end, he said he understood and why we're out here. Activists filed a report with Sunrise Police against a couple that ran down with their motorcycle handing over video of the crime. Another man who allegedly brandished a weapon. No one from either side was arrested. And they're out at a black county, a broad county ranger, provided activists with a cooler of bottles of water. Some burned and sway the activists guzzled it down. As soon as it was just right, Vaughn says we kept pushing and pushing the envelope. I saw the video. Honest. And I'm not going to go condemning all the activists from Black Lives Matter. However, there's a bunch of them, but not, they're not too sharp. And I say that out of respect. You do a protest. You don't use F this, F that, and F your heritage, and F the flag, or blocking, or blocking traffic. When you block traffic. That's a challenge. And that's a threat. I see that out of respect. It has happened so many times in the past. Some of the folks have to learn their history really, really well. I'm very disappointed in a good amount. I'm not going to condemn BLM as a whole. Because there's a lot of good people in this group. But if you think the blacks are the only ones that got problems during that time, I have to say I have to disagree. 
Yes, the Confederacy of America did have a rough edges, and I've repeated this in the past. You can't shut things down. That is wrong and unconstitutional. But one day, your rallies, your protest, your assembly can get the same treatment. Do you want that? I don't. Always know everything, what happened during that time. Do you believe the Confederacy had the issues on slavery? The northern states had them too. The Irish were enslaved. The Irish were forced, or they tried to conscript the Irish to, um, who didn't have $300 to fight for the Union Army. People better learn the entire history of that conflict. It was treacherous. It was disturbing. It was more of a cloak and dagger event. I'm not saying here I support or condone slavery. A lot of good people from that particular groups got harshed. But if you study if you study how technology was cut from the slavery cost, especially with the cotton gin, the slave demand had been going down. And I'll let you folks know too, in the Confederacy Constitution of the Confederacy of America, importation of slavery was prohibited. Please look it up. Always know the other side, why they seceded from the Union. A lot of things, my friends, has to be addressed. And each and every one of us can make a difference. There's bigger fish to fry, as far as I'm concerned. Right now, with this little rally, you're just playing with, you're just playing with pebbles. These folks out there don't give a damn about any of us. Rather, if you're a supporter of Southern Pride, Confederate Heritage, or Black Lives Matter, there's people that don't give a damn about any of us. You fight the real enemy. The past of today's greatest teacher, absolutely. Did a lot of, did a lot of, did a lot of um, blacks during that time got treated like garbage? I'm not going to deny that. Many of them got their rights got taken away, the right to keep and bear arms. I condemn that with a passion. Even Northern states like Maryland had the same laws. Here's another thing, too. Can you explain why in history, too, the United States had slaves, but they slaughtered people and under that flag, slaughtered many Native Americans as well. So all lives matter. But if you're going to use profanity and say, F your heritage, F your flag, right? this, is, this is the first time this partic- some particular people did this for Black Lives Matter. I heard it, I, I've seen a video before, even in Fort Lauderdale, using derogatory, using Pro, using the F word, F word, and ridiculing the police and all that. Don't get me wrong, police corruption exists. But you know what? That's unprofessional. To me, that's paper activism. If you gotta go out there, do it right, do it on principle. Even if you study the Confederacy, Give me two examples that were two, people, two generals, two honorable generals that was against slavery. Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Look it up. Okay? Look it up. Going backwards. That's how I'm looking at it. Don't get caught in the hype. Study history. Knowledge is power. Ignorance is enslavement. So, some certain things on the video, yes, very, very disappointed. Some people may claim about branching a farm. There's no, there's no documentation on it that I witness. But if you're gonna block traffic, even on the highway, on the road, you may be looking for trouble. It can backfire on you. They can use stand your ground. You can say it's racist. It will be irrelevant. All lives matter, my friend. One thing I noticed too, a couple flags, even when InfoWars talks about it, but I had a, and I saw the video, it was uh, meritable. A couple flags I see too, I find a very much of a turnoff. One person was waving a black and yellow, black and red flag, and another one's a green and black flag. Okay? One is, explains anarcho communism and anarcho green, the green part. 
I'm not going to go bash the green cards and like that. But even there's a little site here I'm going to add to it from brightonca.wordpress.com. And it talks about anarchism, and it shows you the flag. Black and red flag of anar- anar- anarcho symbol. Um, Syndicalism and anarcho communism. And this is interesting what it says here on here on this. And um, and it says here, anarchism has many schools of thought, some of them which are detailed below. And this is what the anar- anarcho communism, anarcho syndicalism says. These are social anarchist theories based on arounding a stateless cat- c- class of society free of capitalism and hierarchy. The primary difference be- between is the two is their attitudes to unions. Syndicalist prefers to work with work in pl- work, workplaces with the aiming of uniting all workers into one big union and sparking off a general strike. Communists tend to work with the local community rather than workplace and tend to have much jaded view of trade unions. In the UK, the main anarcho-syndicalist group is the Solidarity Federation, and the main anarcho group is the Anarchist Federation. Their flag is black and red. So what's interesting about that People better think capitalism is bad. But the problem is, you have to have more detail. All right? More detail. So I question some of these individuals in these movements. And I say that out of respect. I warn people in the past that you got to be, every movement institution, you have to respect plant provocateurs or hired goons. Be, be, be careful what you wish for, folks. Better know what these symbols and these symbolic flags are. And know what it means. And be very observant and pay attention. Here's another thing, too. Green anarchist, anarchist, primivicist. Green anarchist puts the environment at the heart of the struggle, putting emphasis on the environmental destruction caused by capitalism and stating that climate change cannot be halted within this, the state capitalist system. And that goal primitivist takes these ideas a step further, blaming the current environmental crisis on the concept of civilization as a whole and advocating a return to a pre-industrial state. The main primitivist theories are Derek Jensen and John Zarzan. The flag is unsurprisingly green and black. So, there's other flags in here as well you can look at. So, I'm definitely going to put this in here in good faith. And always tell folks this, always support conforming with the land instead of drastically changing it. There's got to be some balance. But now with technology, we can make a difference on that. But if you're, if you're going to just bash capitalism as a whole, do your homework first. An open free market is voluntary. State capitalism, they try to shove it down our throats, which is, which is the rope to corporatism. See, I can fight that with you folks. I can go side by side. But if you're going to blame capitalism as a whole, Think your ideas are gonna be um, gonna be utopic? You're living in a pipe dream. But you are gonna have corrupt individuals in these movements and these economics are just as tyrannical as the fascistic ones. So I'm just venting a little bit, but you have to be very observant and always pay attention. Like I said, some of the signs, I'm very disappointed with some of the protesters. I say that out of love. I'm not angry at them or anything like that. There's a letdown. I let the, I informed them, some of them, on my Facebook page. Just go in there, have an honorable discussion. Learn what they're trying to address. Not just go after them, call them racist pigs and Nazis. Because you know why? It makes you the fools, the jokers. You're just the same. That those actions, where I'm just before mentioned, are the same people that wore the Confederate flag shirt saying it's a little white thing you don't understand. You're on that same level. That's why it is a letdown. That's not how we do. That's not how I do things. And there's people, and I'll be honest. There's people I um, have honorable discussions. We may have some disagreements, but you know what's cool? We have to. Um, we have a great discussion. We learn from each other. We share information, and we have and we treat each other like brothers and sisters. Those 
It's called common interest. Focused on that. Even with the southern, southern fragment. Have, see what you have in common and build on that. And you can have a more broadening foundation that will drive the tyrants in the rather the state, federal, local, state, and federal governments in the one world or new world order. Drive them crazy. You guys got the technology and the knack. Use it well. This is why when I see paper activists using profanity and sound like a bunch of slaves, you're not sons of material. Those, they know who they are. And I have, I am digressing. But that is it. You can make your own judgment. So I'm going to add these flags to my footnotes. And here... The next one is interesting. Everyone's hype and hoopla on Donald Trump, which is possible to pay. I'm critical of this guy, but doesn't mean he's always wrong. But here's the thing I'm going to be, be reading from the newamerican.com. It's entitled, What's in Donald Trump Immigration Plan? And it says here, speak is by Warren Mass to be exact. It says here. Speaking in an exclusive interview with NBC's Chuck Todd on Meet the Press on August 16th, presidential candidate Donald Trump shown said if we're, if, if we're elected, we would reverse President Obama's executive orders on immigration and deport illegal aliens from the United States. Executive orders are illegal anyway. Don't comply. Now we'll continue on here. Todd interviewed the real estate mandate abroad, Trump's private plane, as an idol on a runway in Des Moines, Iowa, a state that has considerable political importance because its caucuses are usually the first major electoral events on the presidential nominating process. Trump told Todd that we have to rescind Obama's executive orders order, offering those brought to the U.S. illegally as children known as Dreamers, protection from deportation, as well as Obama's unilateral moves to delay deportation for their families. We have to make a whole set of new standards for those immigrating to the United States. The NBC News quote Trump. Todd questioned Trump about his plan as follows. Todd says here, are you going to, are you going to split up families? Are you, going to, are you going to deport children? Trump goes, Chuck, no, no. No, we're going to keep families together. We have to keep families together. And Todd goes, but you're going to keep them together out? Trump says, but they have to go. But they have to go. Todd says, what if they had no place to go? Trump says, we will work with them. If they have to go, Chuck, we will either have a country or we don't have a country. As it says here, also on August 16th, a summary of Trump's immigration plan was posted on his campaign website under the headline, Immigration Reform That Will Make America Great Again. The post listed three core principles what it described as rural immigration reform. A nation without borders is not a nation. There must be a wall across the southern border. Okay? A nation without laws is not a nation. Law passed in coordinates with the constitutional system of government must be enforced. A nation that does not serve its own citizens is not a nation. An immigration plan must improve jobs, wages, and security for all Americans. The Post went on to provide specifics on the plan including how Trump would force Mexico to pay for a wall on our southern border. It's a dramatic challenge at the very least. Plan to justify this action by noting that Mexico has taken advantage of the United States by encouraging illegal migration to the north in order to export crime and poverty in their own country. It's not, it goes on to note quite correctly that consists that cost the United States has been extraordinary as U.S. taxpayers paid hundreds of billions in health care, housing, education, and welfare costs for these illegal aliens. The article also addresses the devastating effect of illegal immigration on job seekers, especially black Americans. The plan notes that the impact on crime created when criminals cross our border illegally. New America has noted this impact in several articles, including Obama administration has released 167,000 illegals with criminal records. As for how Trump would get to Mexico to pay for the cost of a border wall, he would not necessarily expect the Mexicans to pay us, but would recoup the cost as follows. Impound all remittance payments derived from illegal wages. 
money sent back to a relative in Mexico by illegals working in the United States. Increased fees on temporary visas issued to Mexican, Mexican CEOs and diplomats. Increased fees on all border crossing guards. Increased fees on NAFTA worker visas from Mexico. Increased fees at ports of entry to the United States from Mexico and possible. Increased tariffs and cut foreign aid. It's possibly determined without knowing that's, that's what steps the Mexican government might take in retribution. How many of these steps would be effective on how many would produce negative economic fallout? Other parts of Trump's plan will probably receive a more unquestioned positive response from constitutionalists, including those falling under the category defend the law in the Constitution of the United States. These steps include tripling the number of ICE officers, implementing a nationwide e-verify system. This proposal will not sit well with those who value Americans' right to privacy, who will see, and sit, see as an invitation for more government snooping on innocent Americans. Former Congressman Ron Paul, among others, has warned that this national ID scheme will allow federal bureaucrats to collect biometric information, potentially including fingerprints, retinal scans, and more. That could and likely would be eventually used as a tracking device. It would also make it illegal for anyone to work in the United States without obtaining a national ID, which is likely the motivation for proposing it in the first place. Trump's proposal will go on. Mandatory return for all criminal aliens to their home countries. Detention of those illegally crossing up borders until they are deported. No catch and release. Defunding sanctuary cities, which refuse to cooperate with the federal law enforcement. Enhanced penalties for overstaying a visa. Cooperation by ICE officers, local gang task force against gangs composed of illegal aliens. Ending birthright citizenship for children born in the United States whose parents are here, are, are here illegally. To put the immigration issue in perspective, some background information is in order. Among the Obama administration's most widespread amnesty programs was one giving special privileges to the DREAMers as part of the Deferred Action for Child Arrival DACA program. DACA began with executive action ordered by President Obama and was prompted by his frustration with the Federal Congress to pass the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors Act. After two Congresses failed to pass the act, Obama unilaterally decided to implement it in any way, and on June 15, 2012, he announced that his administration would stop deporting young illegal immigrants who met certain criteria previously proposed under the DREAM Act. That one was formally initiated by a policy memorandum sent from Secretary of Homeland Security Jen Napolitano in 2012 to the heads of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection CB, CB, CBP, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and U.S. Immigration and Custom Enforcement, which is ICE, ordering them to practice prosecutorial discretion towards some individuals who are brought to this country illegally as children and have remained in the country illegally. Now, Patano's successor, D. Johnson, continued the amnesty when he was an executive action memorandum on November 20th to the heads of the same federal agencies entitled Excise the Prosecutorial Discretion with the respect to individuals who came to the United States as children and with respect to certain individuals who are parents of U.S. citizens or permanent residents. U.S. District Judge Andrew S. Hannon of the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of Texas in Brownsville issued an injunction on February 16th that blocked Johnson from implementing the Deferred Action Rental of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residence Program and expanded DACA by removing its age cap extending work authorization for some illegal aliens to three years. In some summation, the Trump immigration plan will likely appeal to conservatives and constitutionalists we see the unchecked flow of legal immigrants into our nation and our poor border enforcement as an economic burden, a contributor to our nation's crime rate, and a threat to our very sovereignty. Trump's appeal to this same constituency on other issues, however, remain, remains to be seen. He may have some good points. The question is with the wall. If you build a wall, Cannot be like the Berlin Wall. 
got something to think about. And this is how I look at it too. How come we should have troops and so forth in good faith, watch our borders, get rid of the North American Union plan, which is part of the open border scheme under the United States, Mexico, and Canada, and in, Me in Mexico itself, the people, which has been happening, they're fighting cartels and corruption. I think every Mexican state has tyranny, and if the Mexico City, if the federal government in their country can't do anything about it, they should start denouncing them and do a secession. I know it's very dangerous. It's like a lot of good, beautiful people down there. Good folks in Mexico and other countries. I'm not going to go around saying they're all oh, this or condemn Mexico. They legal down there. Many of them, many of them, it has to be an immigration policy, it has to be across the board. There's too many like conditions and selections. That's why I find pretty irrelevant. I say that out of respect. So Trump may have some good points, but you got to be very vigilant and leery. There's some other areas I'm not too fond of. People don't believe the hype, my friends. But be aware. He may have some good pointers, but how's it going to be implemented? That's the question. Everyone's talking about, oh, Trump's doing great as a presidential candidate, you know? But you know what? I'm not going to jump the gun. I'll be in a bandwagon. I just want to look at everything more thoroughly or dynamic. So my friends, always remain vigilant. No matter who's running. Don't follow the hype. Just pay attention. And we all know about the whole thing with the North American Union and legal immigration is part of the Club of Rome platform. Or the one world order. And I see it's just an example. This is happening worldwide, by the way. Even Australia has issues, Canada, um, Hungary. I did talk about them in my past podcast archives. You can look it up yourselves. So that's what you got to be careful. Watch out for divide and rule as well. All right. Next one here. One moment. Came from. I think I messed up here. That's okay. That yeah, like a little bit of a, a little bit of a mishap. That's okay. Things happen. Things do happen, my friends. But you always gotta see things in the bigger picture. So that's always been keen. And that's okay. Do, 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 do. Just hang tight here. Where are you? Ah, you know what? This is a little bit better. Actually, this is from Blacklisted News, and actually, this cook source came from Free Beacon. And this instead. This one's from the Washington Free Beacon, and it's entitled, TSA Spends $160 Million on Failed Body Scanners. Came out yesterday by Morgan Chomflint. And as it reads here, the Transportation Security Administration spent $160 million on body scanners that have largely failed to detect airport security threats. The local reported that governmental agency paid $120 million for the body scanner currently in place at airport checkpoints across the country, in addition to another $40 million on the naked X-ray naked scanners removed from airports two years ago, and health for amid health and privacy concerns. The TSA, which recently disclosed the cost to members of Congress, probably the agency on the average spent over $150,000 per unit of body imaging technology since it first began purchasing the scanners in 2008. 
The acting TSA head was reassigned in June after security audit revealed that the agency's devices have failed to detect fake weapons and explosives 96% of the time in secret tests. Then the Congress and both parties will have been probing. The government agency are concerned with the costly but largely insufficient TSA body imaging equipment. Senate Homeland Security Chairman Ron Johnson, Republican from Wisconsin, said that scanners are so unsuccessful. They, they, these things weren't even catching metal, he warned, and that they should pre- be perceived by metal detectors. If you really want to keep, if you want to keep using those, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, at a minimum, we should put a metal detector on the side, Johnson said. We might, we, why not go, go through two? You just, you just got, you just got to use common sense. Ranking member of House Homeland Security Committee, Representative Bernie Tom- Benny Thompson, Democrat from Mississippi, described himself as a trouble about their capability to detect and prevent dangerous materials from passing through security checkpoints. Senator Tom Carper, Democrat from Delaware, the ranking member of Senate Homeland Security Committee, suggested that the agency might be better off trying to find ways beyond technology to overhaul security measures. In a situation like this, if one bad person gets through that they have a bomb or a weapon, it could be a terrible tragedy for hundreds of people. Carper explained, so I think we have an obligation to look around the world and look at the technology here to find better ways on an ongoing basis to protect our safety and security. The TSA, in a statement, voiced its commitment to improve screening effectiveness, including new training for all TSA officers, improvements in alarm resolution procedures, and in partnership with private sector partners, a range of measures to increase detection standards of our screening equipment. The government agency has spent tens of millions of dollars on other types of failed equipment. This is a real shame. And, um, and my friend, that's why I was really questioned and leery about the whole TSA program. And got good folks in this department. I'm not going to condemn them. However, I was against the body. I was against the body scanners. Period. And I and I support army pilots and the staff, but they want you to go through hoops and, and all that. And don't get me wrong. Yeah, there's people that do want should train them. Okay, to train them to get in, to to, um, to know how to use it in the plane. Okay, don't like don't shoot them with a bazooka or anything like that. That'll be totally uh, irrelevant. This is just another example of federal government waste. And the whole thing is, too, my friends, that most a lot of the airports around the country are county, city and county, public public domain, public 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 property, government and pro, public property on a local level. And so, how I look at it, you have to have better security for this or have have these um, planes be more pro self defense more more pro self defense tactics. They want to just okay, have to go through hoops and I know there are pass pass like they're doing things totally ludicrous grabbing someone's crotch, come on. Or have to take their pants off. I see videos like that with kids it's totally nefarious. Why these bias cameras don't work? Remember, every high gadget has a flaw. And some people, some reporters did that in the past. Even as really agent, even as really security staff goes, I can go through there with a bomb they don't even know. That tells you something. You can probably look this up, just type it down. But, um, I just really just scratches my head too, my friends, on these things. But always sell this. Support, but be more bill of pro bill of rights and pro tyranny. And I'm not saying the TSA agents are all bad. I met some good people there. Now commend them. They are trying to do things better. But the bottom line is this: five scanners are a sham. People don't find a way to use weapons, even if it's plastic. You can cut someone. You can take. You can, you can take someone out with a plastic, uh, plastic uh, dagger made of plexiglass. It won't be detected. Other people, in the, I'll say this: even people in the in the um, what 
pastors gotta remain vigilant. And another thing too, I made a good point about domestic weapons, cans of soda, straws. Is there so many things you can use against these individuals? You'd be surprised. But always support your freedom. Never get up for security. And this is right here. Fail, failed body scanners is to me is just um, another example of watching waste. All right, next one here came from um, Asian Asia Times. Uh, it's a very no, so kind of on a time basis. Like yeah. But you want to send you a text. And this one here is entitled cool. Esco Buck who profits from Bangkok. Who profits from the King Bangkok fine. Got this from um, okay. Thai yeah. Times. It's like, it's like uh, the same guy who does uh, Land Destroyer, if I'm correct. And it says here Bangkok. He came out to Bangkok. The guy in a yellow t shirt, long short, unruly black hair, dark. Like dark sunglasses, dark glasses. Arrive at the Iran shrine in a tuk tuk. Tuk tuk. Hopefully I pronounced that right. No one may have noticed him, just another nondescript backpacker, one of the biggest crossroads in Asia. He may have come to pay some respect to the golden statue of Rama at the center of the shrine and gaze on Thai dancing musicians in the background. He sits on the bench, then slowly he gets rid of the black backpack. He stands up, checks his mobile, and he walks away, stops. Actually, he seems to be calling someone on his mobile. Then he finally leaves Aaron, Aaron hitting the crowded intersection, clutching a white plastic bag, but always checked in on it, checking his phone. He may or may not have known all his movements, were being tracked by multiple CCTV cameras. A few minutes after he disappears from the system of silence and allegedly takes a motor motorbike taxi, he enters with a lethal bang in the wilderness of marriage that is contemporary Thailand. Who is he? The Thai police convince he's none other than the Bangkok bomber. There seem to be no other prime CCTV capture candidates. The first leak Describe him as an Arab like man. That's quite vague. And that there is a huge, bustling, mini Middle East only to strike train stations away from the Iran shrine. But that, that was enough to ring all Al Qaeda ISIS bells across the planet. Then, then a quote was wrongly attributed to General Prime Minister Prayuth Chan Achoa, the head of the Quaintly Aurelian National Council for Peace and Order, which rules over Thailand after a coup in May 2014. Prayu was actually referring to someone when he stated the suspect was believed to be a Northeast based Richard member as a faithful follower of self exile corruption tainted billionaire tycoon, former Prime Minister Takasin Shinarada. And that's Thai wilderness and mirrors in full regalia. The guy in the U in the yellow t-shirt may be an Arab terrorist. He may be an indigenous anti-military red shirt operative. He might even be something in between a Thai Muslim separatist. The blow black dervish, dervish dance. Royal Thai Army Chief and Deputy Minister General Udomai. Sipitur stressed the 3K pipe bomb at the Arun Shrine did not match the tactics of Muslim separatist rebels in Thailand as deep south, even though there has been a recent surge of IED attacks on 27th and July alone, but just confined to the deep south. Thailand's Muslim guerrilla is all about separatism, not religion. The key guerrilla outfits is the Barzarian Reza. The Rosalie National B, National B, BRN. That what they want is essentially full, full autonomy of time from Thailand's to be southern border provinces. Anani, Nazareth, Nazareth, Iran, and Yala. So this may be, may not be prime, prime Al Qaeda style Jama Islamia terrorists, terrorism, not to mention ISIS, ISIL, Daesh. 
but the conservative Muslim clerics and the deep south worry about this Thai cultural imperialism. But that does not preclude, of course, the insidious attempts at hardcore Islamization and combative South Asian jihadists defeated by their Wahhabi matrix are quite indebted at that. By the way, Jamal Adamah on the record fully supports Muslim separatism in Thailand and the separatists in the military junta in Bangkok are not talking about peace or otherwise. There's a guy who wears a t-shirt a Yagura. The connection remains plausible as the Aran Shrine is extremely popular among Chinese and most Asians for that matter. Thailand was rocked last month by nearly a scandal more than a hundred suspected of terrorism by Beijing was reported for the China. There's a fact that there is a Yuri connection in the Deep South itself. That's a training stopover after they leave the Western China to their idolized, idealized future as moderate rebels in Syria. Some of the deported were indeed planning to raid jihad in Syrac. As Beijing intel was condensed, calling me surprising that Chinese TV shows them on the plane back to China enveloped by black hoods. A regular blowback, dervish dance final, an attack on the Thai consulate in Turkey. With a proverbial American connection, the attacks was coordinated by the World Uyghur Congress, which is essentially financed by the now banned in Russia NED, supported by the Notably, stand faction of the State Department. Timing and location, location, location. The guy in the yellow t shirt certainly has a gift for timing, assuming he's the real Bangkok bomber. He turned the self described city of life into a city of death only one day after hundreds of thousands of ties and blue shirts cycled across the city in the bike for mom's spectacular. A two real homage to the Queen's birthday led by Prince Maha himself. Another photo of that too is very horrific. So this is to let you folks know. And what's where the wilderness of mirrors unveils or reflects the tide of world succession and since the coup in 2014, General Prime Minister Paul's pride and joy had been have been to provide Thailand with some sort of stability. Yes, this is a military junta. Most people, at least in Bangkok, are not complaining compared to nasty polarization and appalling violence. In the past decade, this looks feels like a five-star spa. The price was paid by democracy, cracked down all forms of political protest, silencing, ignoring, and, uh, and, the, and the opposition as a whole, a wave of arrest. But now, the going gets tougher last year. General Prime Minister Perel was saying that democracy would be back by October 2015, two months from now. The new world new maps fell out. Elections only maybe be by 2017. The draft of the new constitution is due voted. Be voted next month by the also currently Aurelian National <laughs> Reform Council and a Republic referendum may or may not happen in January 2016. Sounds like 1984 in Thailand, I see here. Huh? Interesting. It's all supposed to be in place in the case the world succession is relatively imminent. Reverend King, Bon Boy's health is faltering, and the uh, crown, Crown's Prince puppet profile displayed in full and fun regalia for the bite for mass attack is part of the softening of the transition. Key subsects, all avenues of the desk in Shinarada and, the, and his red shirt army. Plan to come back must be closed ASAP as soon as possible. Stability? What stability? Bangkok's bombing day after was marked by yet another IED. This one this one thrown a bridge across the Kayo Praia River. It, it missed a boat in a bustling Zaporn City, very close to the Shangri La Hotel by Whisker and exploded in the war. Target once again, local terrorists and local, local civilians echoing defense. Pirate Ragason mm, Raguswan, sub, sub, substantially correct initial verdict at the Iran shrine. The per, uh, perpetrators intended to destroy the, the economy and tourism. And 
that may be the point to military junta's ultimate nightmare. What if the guy in the yellow shirt detonated a real campaign, willing campaign to target all Bangkok's top tourist magnets? Thailand is not exactly stagnated, according to the credit Swiss. It may grow 2.5% this year, not shabby in a downward global economy, but no less than two thirds of the GDP's growth comes from tourism. Tourism from Asia. Hong Kong has already issued a red alert on travel to Thailand. Out of the fatal victims of Iran, there are so far, apart from five Thais, three Chinese, two Hong Kong residents, two Malaysians, one Singaporean, one Indonesian, one Filipino. Many of the wounded are from China and Taiwan. Special booths near the shrine were set up with plenty of Chinese translators to help the victims relatives and even Chinese media. What's certain is that the Bangkok bomber already smashed the doctor's credibility. The kind of stability is what when the military could not see it coming. The largest deadliest terrorist attack in the history of Bangkok. The next step may be well may well be rounded up the usual red shirt suspects as the leaders of the faithful road warriors are disposed twice since Chinracho of Clan, a pipe bomb packed with three kilograms of TNT and wrapped in cloth, has presidents. Only six months ago, two small pipe bombs were exploded near the upscale of Siam Paragon Mall. Not from the Aaron Shrine, responsibility was attributed to the Red Shirts. This only happened This only happened one month after the National Assembly, controlled by the General Prime Minister, decided that the former spectacularly inefficient Prime Minister. Yungluk Chinaracha should be excluded from politics for five years. And one of the two suspects who fired grenades at Thailand's criminal court building earlier this year happened to be close to Shakin's Shakin's cousin, Chinese Chinaracha. Hope I pronounced these names right. Yep, and don't forget the wilderness of mirrors. Bangkok's felt valet corridors have been shaken by rumors of a counter. There are factions not exactly amused by the general prime minister too comfortably set settling down in the power seat. Most of all, these factions are increasingly incensed by the very close Bangkok-Beijing relationship. And the shady forces controlling the Ghana Yellow Shirt thought they could masquerade the air and master at the Deep South style IED blast, but it didn't stick. We already know the losers. Thailand's fragile unity, Thailand's economy, Heavenly depend, dependent on tourism and a geopolitical big prize, the multi layered Thai Chinese relationship, which includes several instances of the new Silk Roads. But we still don't know who employed the guy in the yellow shirt. Is he, is, is he a red shirt? Is he a jihad? To be indoctrinated and trained by the usual suspects. Is he, oh sweet, smell of conspiracy, CIA black ops? In cahoots with the new U.S. ambassador in Thailand, Glenn Davies, a specialist on the non military force to advance regime change options or Thailand's essential vote in favor of an anti China TPP. The Yanni Yellow Shirt in a lost wilderness of mirrors may have some answers, but please don't go cowboy and ask questions later. Well, well, well. Guess another thing was happening on the other side of the world. Something you have to really think about, too, on this. So they don't know who the suspect is. Things are happening in Bangkok on and off, and it's really horrible. Send so my condolences to all the victims of this bombing. But you have people got to be thorough. Have, you have, you have, you have, everything has to be done in good faith. Don't be, don't go right around and get anyone to have a yellow shirt. But you don't know for sure. So something people got to realize. Even in Bangkok, they have their problems. And there's probably a claim of, of a Aurelian platform that may be occurring in Thailand. So, uh, one thing I say for sure, my friends, you have to examine the bigger picture. And the truth of the matter is, the war on terror is a war with the people. So, uh, I guess it's going to be one more thing and I'll be done. This one here came from Activist Post. Yeah, I 
I said, really good one here. And um, came out yesterday. It says here, overcoming the fear, trap, and activism and conspiracy research. It's done by John Vibes. He, he does good work, I will say that. It says here, I believe in many conspiracies and found that they exist all throughout history. From false flag operations to ruling caste figures that sit behind governments to the corrupt of societal institutions and even ravaging different versions of our close and distant fair history. These things do exist, and they do exist everywhere. However, there are many common threads of conspiracy culture that I have found to be paralyzing and counterproductive. In this article, we're going to specifically... Sorry about that. Discuss fear in regards to activism and conspiracy research. There is understandably a proximity to fear when you realize how the world is truly ruled by slavery and violence. This fear can be especially infectious when one, when one first learns that nearly everything they have been told about a society is a lie. It's fairly common for someone to think that the sky is falling when they begin their path in activism. But many soon learn that they have merely discovered a situation that has existed in the same basic function since many ages ago. At this point, they can move on in their research towards finding empowering solutions, both in their personal growth, their impact on those around, around them. Sadly, it is a sizable group that struggles to escape the, the fear-based mindset as they continue their research and activism. Some people stay trapped in the mindset for years, some for their entire lives. It does not mean we should stray from scary or negative topics. There is some very messed up stuff going on in this world. We need to face it, to head on with a healthy level of fear. However, we do not want this fear to distract us from solutions or keep us so apathetic that we do not seek solutions out. All often, when, solu when solutions oriented activists suggest that actions need to be taken, whether it be in protest, defensive armament, agorism, or other means, the fear-based activists will be, quick, will be quick to tell us that our actions will bring us closer to a disaster or they think they will spark the final showdown that will result in total genocide and or enslavement of humanity. It should be easy to see how this thinking can be paralyzed and counterproductive. We're going through right now, not we are going through right now, may seem crazy and unusual, but really, it's nothing new. Sure, it is true that the paradigm that we live under is currently a free fall and a collapse, but there has been a long time coming, and it has happened to nearly every civilization has ever erected a palace and asserted authority over large groups of people. This type of system is out of line with a natural balance and will never last that simple fact of life. For this, we have every reason to make any and all preparations we deem to be necessary, but we should not be consumed by fear to the point we are considering violence or this, this his, uh, the hizzle, the hillism, nihilism, excuse me. The reason why there is so much fear around the obvious downfall of our civilization is because people have grown detached from their communities and have lost their ability to be self sufficient. Fear can be extremely, can be extremely healthy thing that can motive us to seek solutions. This is exactly how the feeling should be reacted to. Fear could also be an unhealthy thing when it overwhelms and drives us to believe that no solutions are even possible. And that is true. You have to look at everything in the fine-tuned column. They all, everyone has their pros and cons. Fear, fear, when you use the fear factor, you should always try to have it to be productive, have ideas. Instead of putting your head in the sand like an ostrich. I've been doing this for quite a while. People tell me, you gotta be careful what you say. And you know what? I can't live like that. And I was in, I was tipped off on my uh, 
I'm on their crap list myself. But I'm not surprised because when you, when individuals learn we have a gift to empower ourselves and inspire others, you can break that Pablo's, uh, Pablo's dog theory. Like, they all want to be like going into work, going out of work, and be told what to do. Something you can watch Metropolis in 1984. Like they're two very good two examples. Movies, if you're going to read the book, that's fine too. But the movies are, are, are good. And they haven't already had the, there's two versions of 1984, by the way. I guess they didn't teach you that. So um, definitely check it out. It all is a mind control. Mind control 101. We can all break that. Many books are out there on spirituality, self consciousness. Awareness, etc. Some of the people may be maybe may, may be kooky in your realm, but you have to look at everything in a broader perspective. Action conquers fear. Use it out of awareness. If you get fear, use it with awareness and be productive. In a period of time, it can benefit. Many people die. For, many people got killed for what they was trying to put out. But you know what? Now with technology, you can't kill us all. It's okay to play the role of cockroaches. You can't terminate us all. When you do these activisms and do your research, verify everything. And share with others. Have merit. That's the key. Not simple. Not simple at all. And that is really it. I'd like to thank you, my friend, for listening to this episode. Plus, feel free to download and share this throughout your social media network. If you have any questions, comments, compliments, criticisms, love letters, hate letters, etc., or you can send me some cool, cool links, information, always use it with decorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Spreaker, and iHeartRadio. Or you can email me at bogeyluck3 at gmail.com. Once again, thank you for your time. Let's always remember that demoniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading love and may your guardian spirits be with you.